Thanks, Julie. And thanks so much to Catholic University for hosting this super cur curriculum and this event today. Today, we'll explore the root causes of poverty, of the social ills that tarnish human dignity and hinder human flourishing. And we'll also discuss effective solutions to these problems, solutions that acknowledge the dignity of those in need and provide greater opportunities for self-sufficiency and independence. We hope that you'll take what you learn here back to your dorm rooms, your classrooms, to start a campus-wide conversation about what true justice for the poor looks like and how you can better help those in need right here in Washington, D.C. Before we, be we begin, we need to consider our answers to what might seem like obvious questions. What is poverty? How do we talk about it? We often talk about poverty in terms of justice, particularly the buzzword social justice. But what does social justice mean? What does it look like? How we answer these questions and how we think about justice shapes both how we pursue it and who we trust to address the problem of poverty. As you'll hear tonight, good intentions aren't enough. Just because a policy or an approach is in the name of social justice doesn't mean it always uh, delivers on that outcome. Many policies that sound good have unintended consequences that actually end up hurting those they were intended to help. The goal of overcoming poverty is not simply to eliminate need, but to enable people to thrive, to empower them to live meaningful lives and contribute to society. That begins with correctly diagnosing the, suf the suffering we see around us. In the US, poverty is often rooted in problems deeper than a lack of money or material possession. Whether it's a father abandoning his children, a broken marriage that turns a spouse to drugs, or a teenager looking for acceptance in all the wrong places, poverty and social breakdown often stem from people wrongly relating to something or someone. These broken relationships, in turn, often lead to material and financial hardship. If poverty is often caused by broken relationships, then we have to ask, Who's best equipped to address individual needs and do the hard work of redemption? As we will learn this evening, it takes families and churches doing the hard work of restoring relationships. It requires community groups providing support and training, businesses providing opportunities for work, and government maintaining the rule of law so that the rest can function. Tonight you'll have the opportunity to hear from your own Dr. Jay Richards and someone who is considered the godfather of the neighborhood empowerment movement, Bob Woodson. They'll talk specifically about the role of free enterprise and entrepreneurship and empowering those in need to overcome dependency. And they'll talk, discuss effective poverty fighting initiatives that begin at the ground level in families, close friendships, and mentoring relationships. First off tonight, you'll hear from Jay. He's an assistant research professor here in the School of Business and Economics at CUA and a senior fellow at the Discovery Institute. He is the author of many books, including New York Times bestseller, Infiltrated, and Indivisible, and Money, Greed, and God. His latest book, which I would highly recommend, The Hobbit Party, discusses the political and economic ideas of beloved author J.R.R. Tolkien. Jay holds a PhD in philosophy and theology from Princeton Theo Theological Seminary, as well as a master's in divinity and theology. Immediately after Jay's presentation, you'll be able to hear from Bob Woodson, who's the founder and president of the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that supports neighborhood-based initiatives to reduce crime, restore families, and create economic enterprise. Under his leadership, the center has provided training to more than 2,600 leaders of community-based groups in 39 states. The center's youth violence reduction program he created, called the Violence Free Zone, is effectively reducing violence in many of the nation's most troubled schools with sites in Baltimore, Milwaukee, and pretty close to here in Richmond, Virginia. Bob is the author of numerous books and has received the esteemed Presidential Citizens Medal. Once both speakers are finished with their presentation, we'll have a few minutes for Q&A. But now, join me in welcoming Jay. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. This is sort of awkward having the three of you over there, but I won't insist that you move. But um, can you see the slides here? What are you sitting over here on the right? <laughs> it's great to be with you. Some of you may remember we were going to do this in the fall, and there was that concert that the faculty and administration did not anticipate until the day of the concert. So uh, we'd already sort of prepared for this. So actually, I, I was glad to see it wasn't a beautiful sunny day, so that at least some of you would show up tonight. Uh, you're going to hear from two talks tonight. Normally, I think you hear from just one person. So I want to talk very briefly, and it's essentially a one-point talk. There is literally one point that I want to get 
through to you. And it's right there on the title of the slide. Good intentions are not good enough. I actually had a kind of Twitter conversation about this today with a guy, and he said, are you saying that people should have bad intentions? I said, well, no, of course not. He said, are you saying that if people have good intentions, they want to do bad things? No, of course not. My only point is that good intentions aren't good enough if we actually want to help people, and especially if we want to help people in the economic realm with economic policy. Now, it seems like an obvious thing, but usually it's the things that are the easiest to get that are the easiest to forget. And unfortunately, this is one of those issues. I would argue that to, to learn not to do this, to learn not to be distracted by our intentions, what we need to do, even if you're a business, a marketing major, an accounting major, a, an econ major, even if you learn the science of economics, you still need to learn what Henry Hazlitt calls the art of economics. Now think about what an art is. Um, an art, in a sense, certainly art like science has rules. If you're a great sculptor, you've you spent years probably perfecting your craft. You've learned the basic principles of sculpting. But if all you do is think about the rules, right, you never actually become a great sculptor. The only way to become a great sculptor or a great pianist is to take those rules and make them, get them down in your bones so that they're tacit or implicit, so that they're part of your muscle memory, and then you exercise the art sort of uh, uh, effortlessly. That's the art of economics. And in a sense, it's a sort of intellectual discipline. And here's what, here's what Hazlitt says. He says, the art of economics consists in looking not merely at the immediate, but at the longer effects of any act or policy. It consists in tracing the consequences of that policy, not merely for one group, but for all groups. That's not really all that complicated, and it's especially not that complicated when we're talking about economic policy, because in the 20th century, there was a vast array of different kinds of economic experiments, and so we have a pretty good sense, based on the simply a sort of historical record of the 20th century, about what the effects of certain economic policies are. The problem is we often make decisions both as voters, uh, policy makers, politicians, based upon the sort of official motivation behind the policy, rather than the likely or known intended or unintended consequence. And so we don't exercise or practice the art of economics. And I would maintain if you get a 4.0 in economics from CUA and do the master's degree and don't master the art of economics, you're still going to have a very hard time exercising uh, your, your role and your responsibilities as a citizen in the country. Now, why is this a problem? Why is this difficult for us to keep the consequences of actions and the motivations behind actions separate? I would argue that it's actually something that in some ways is more difficult for Christians than for others. And the reason is that we know that morally, both the internal and the external matter. In other words, God cares both what we do and why we do it. In fact, in a sense, why we do things is more important to God than what we do in particular. As long as what we're doing is not an intrinsic evil, God's more concerned about the reason we do things than the mere what that we do. This is the point of the widow's mites, right, in, in Luke 21. Jesus and the disciples are sitting around and they're seeing wealthy people display their wealth and their giving and their offering. And then he sees the poor widow deposit two mites, you know, essentially like, like two pennies. And he picks her out. Does he pick her out because of the significance of her act economically? No, he picks her out because she gave from her poverty. And so in a sense, her act was greater and more sacrificial, more Christ-like than the great gifts of those who gave, at least in part, so that they could be seen giving. God cares why we do things and what we do. In the economic realm, economic policies don't actually care why you support them. Right? Any bill that's considered in, in a Congress down here could be voted on and supported unanimously. 435 members of the House, 100 members of the Senate could be signed by the President. Let's assume they have 536 different motivations for supporting the bill. Now, does that mean there are going to be 536 different consequences on, in those different districts of the members of Congress and the states? No. So the policy is going to have whatever consequence it's going to have based upon the sort of basic logic of the economic realm in which it operates irrespective of the motives of those who support it. In fact, I would argue that if, it, it, in some ways, focusing on motives in economic policy can become a, a decoy or a distraction so that we notice that and we evaluate the morality of a policy based upon what we imagine the motives of those who support it have or the motives of ourselves. 
But if we want to practice the art of economics, we are going to focus like a laser beam on the likely consequences of the policy. Unfortunately, this is not an art that is widely practiced, and it's especially not widely practiced in the area of economic policy. So I want to give you just three brief examples, simply as mental hooks. These are not sort of policy prescriptions, and I'm going to offer solutions here. Bob's going to talk a little bit uh, about solutions after I'm done. All I want to do is give you three mental hooks to see what happens, the kind of things that can happen if you don't practice the art of economics and you focus on intentions rather than consequences. Most of you who've had economics courses probably know this example, but I like it, the example of rent control, because it's actually the sort of perfect illustration of what can happen. Now, rent control is not probably the cities where most of you are from have, you haven't experienced rent control, but rent control was especially popular in the 1970s in large municipal areas, and it, it sort of holds on in places like Manhattan, though with a thousand little, ex little exception. Now, what is rent control? Rent control is essentially a response to an increase in the price of rental housing in sort of high density areas. So imagine you're in Manhattan, city council notices that there's a huge demand for rental housing, the prices for rental housing are going through the roof, and the, the council realizes, you know, lower income people before long are not going to be able to afford rental housing. We gotta do something about this. Now, unfortunately, city councils around the world, when uh, met with this problem, don't tend to practice the art of economics, or at least they didn't tend to initially. So the general idea was, what, well, we've got an idea. Let's set a ceiling on the price of rental housing. So we'll just keep the price down where lower income people can afford it. So imagine, for instance, that uh, you, you just sort of decide, let's say it's going to be $500 a month for one bedroom apartments and $800 for two bedroom and $1,000 for three bedroom apartments. The idea is that you just essentially uh, set a ceiling above which rental prices cannot go legally. So in other words, landlords and property owners are not allowed to charge rent above whatever this sort of designated amount is. Now what's the purpose of policies like this? I would assume the purpose of the policy is to keep prices down where lower income people can afford them. What do you think the effect of this policy is when it takes place in a context of scarcity and high demand? Just give you a few seconds to think, just exercise has its art of economics. Think about it from the perspective of the property owner. Let's say you own a 10-story uh, 10 apartment complex with a bunch of one-bedroom flats in it, and it costs you $800 a month to maintain these one-bedroom, th these individual flats, but you legally can only charge $500 a month rent. Now, what are you going to do? Assuming you're not sort of in business to, to lose money, right, and to eventually go bankrupt, but what you're likely going to do is you're going to either convert the property to a condominium, this happened when we were living in, I was li lived in Seattle for several years. We had to leave an apartment because it was converted to, to condo property. So in other words, it's not rental property anymore, it's sold, right? Or you convert it to co commercial property, so it's a storefront or something like that. Again, not regular residential rental property. Or three, you do things to cut costs, and so you quit maintaining the property, and after a few years, you become a slumlord. All three of those things ultimately lead to a shortage in pro precisely the range of housing that was intended to be protected by the measure. So see, this is, this is what can actually happen because the economic realm is sort of counterintuitive. It's not like you always can just deduce from first principles what's gonna happen in the economic realm. Things can, can go in a different direction. In this case, a policy intended to preserve a certain price range on housing actually creates a shortage of precisely the housing. Right, so that's one simple example. It happens usually at the level of the city. Second example is one of the sort of more depressing examples, and this is an example of something that almost became an international policy. Now, most of you in this room won't remember this, but I remember, because I was in graduate school in 1992, so sort of prior to the internet, it, it existed, but it was nothing like it is now. Uh, and I can remember in USA Today and newspapers around the country, people, Americans started finding out where their tennis shoes and their t-shirts and their sweats were made. I still remember my Adidas sweat outfit, right? This is what I remember discovering that it was made by children someplace in Bangladesh in a factory that, if you looked at it from sort of the American perspective, looked essentially like a sweatshop. And we discovered there were lots and lots of stories of this, that Americans enjoyed cheap goods primarily because they were manufactured uh, primarily in Asian countries and very often by children working very long hours in unsafe conditions. As a result of this, there was a general kind of dislike of the arrangement. And Senator Tom Harkin actually proposed a bill called the Child Labor Deterrence Act. Now what's 
funny about this act is it never actually became law. The purpose of the act, though, was essentially to make it illegal for American companies to do business with factories and manufacturers in, in Asian countries that employed children. That was the, the language of the act, and that was the intention. It bounced around and never actually became law. It was the subject of all sorts of controversies. It never actually happened. What's funny, though, is that many of the companies that had gotten dinged as a result of the bad publicity did what the law would have required anyway. They cut off their relationships with these factories. So what, what's interesting is usually that would be the end of the story. We wouldn't know what happened, except that UNICEF in 1997 actually did a study of the effects, of the sort of perceived effects of the Child Labor Deterrence Act. So remember, the law didn't even pass, but it had an effect. And what UNICEF discovered is that they estimated that something like 50,000 kids that in about in 1990 had been working in these textile factories were no longer working in the factories. Right now, if you're practicing the art of economics, what are you going to do at this point? You're going to wonder where they went, right? Where did they go? Did they all go to local country day school? Did they go to local Catholic school? The UNICEF study found that, in general, those kids that had been working in textile factories in 1990, by 1997, 50,000 of them were generally working in street hustling, rock crushing, and prostitution. Now, no one in the US Congress said, let's come up with a bill that's going to cause kids in Bangladesh to get cast out of textile factories and into the streets. No one thought that. No one wanted that to happen. That's precisely the point. Things happen anyway when it comes to economic policy if we don't think through the consequences. Now, does it, does it follow that there should be no child labor laws or there should be no laws arranging these things? No, that's not the point at all. The point is we've got to find some third alternative that addresses the problem we perceive without creating much more profound problems as a result. Again, easy to say, easy to cite examples, but very hard to learn this virtue, this art of economics, in practice. The third entirely different uh, example of this, and this is, this is a subject that I have actually studied in some detail and actually followed it for a long time until I finally frankly decided that this was never going to get fixed and so there was no reason to write policy papers on it. This has to do with something called the takings provision of the Endangered Species Act. Now, the Endangered Species Act is an act that was passed uh, in, in the early 1970s. In 1973, it was signed by a Republican president, President Rich, Richard Nixon, and at the time it was enacted, there were about 1,200 species of animals and plants within the borders of the United States that were put on the list. In other words, they were either uh, moderately endangered or severely endangered. And the purpose of the Endangered Species Act, quite obviously, was to protect species that had been determined to be in danger of extinction. All right? Now, depressingly, I don't know if anybody knows anything about this, of about the 1,200 or so that were originally on the list, how many do you think have been removed from the list because they've successfully regained their previous standing? I don't want to tell you, but look it up. It's a very, very depressing number. And just the number itself ought to tell us that there's something wrong with the policy and that if we're really interested in preserving endangered species, we should do something different. That's not how these things tend to go. I uh, personally think that one particular provision of the overall act of the Endangered Species Act is primarily the culprit. And it's called the takings provision. The takings provision, it's really just, for, just what it sounds like. The takings provision essentially says this. Imagine you're a landowner uh, and you find an endangered species habitat on your land. Maybe you're a farmer in western Pennsylvania and you find wild lupin growing in one corner of your field. You look this up, you say, this is interesting, and you're seeing these beautiful little butterflies eating this lupin and very preferentially selecting the lupin on your land. And so you look up, you take a picture, you go on the internet, and you discover that it's the Carner Blue Butterfly. And you discover that the Carner Blue Butterfly, unlike pigeons and rats, prefers exactly one thing to eat, unfortunately, wild lupin. Moreover, they're on the Endangered Species Act. So in other words, part of your property is an endangered species habitat. Now let's say you keep reading and you discover that the takings provision allows the government to essentially say, they don't literally take over the government, they don't collectivize the farms like the Soviet Union, but the government, if you find an endangered species habitat, can essentially tell you you can't use your land. Now again, assume that you're a farmer that has let the land lay fallow for a few years to recover, but you need to use it 
in the long run simply for your livelihood. And you discover that if you report it to the authorities, they're not going to let you use your land. What are you likely to do? I didn't make up the scenario. This is actually a carner blue butterfly. It actually eats wild lupin that tends to grow in western Pennsylvania. Well, this, in many cases like this, has actually led to almost a policy, and it describes the response that landowners have. It's called shoot, shovel, and shut up, <laughs> alas. Now, what does this refer to? Well, think about it from the perspective of the landowner. Right? You may, all things being equal, want to preserve the endangered species habitat. But the way the law is set up, you're in conflict, you as the landowner are in conflict with the interest of this endangered species. As a result of the takings provision, what happened is that the, the, the bill was set up essentially to set landowners against the interest of the endangered species that might be found on their land. And the result has been that people find out about this, including in some specific areas. So this is the example I know the most about, but I read a, a story in, in uh, the Audubon magazine a couple of years ago about the same thing happening in an area in North Carolina. There was a, there was a word that the, the, uh, the Department of the Interior was gonna do a survey of the particular part of North Carolina to find out where these particular pine trees were, because the pine trees in this part of North Carolina, as it happens, were the unique habitat of something called the red cockaded woodpecker. And the Audubon Society article, it's great, it's actually online, you can read it, talks about landowners hanging out at the, the Hardee's and the Dairy Queen talking about woodpecker infestations. In other words, the landowners were terrified of finding woodpeckers on their land. And so the local Home Depots, Home Depot and Lowe's actually sold out of chainsaws as a result of this. There's a mass destruction of this particular pine tree on people's uh, land that discovered it. They didn't want to find these woodpeckers on their land. Now again, does this mean that we shouldn't do what we can to protect endangered species? No, absolutely not. What it means is that we actually want to do that. We have to exercise the art of economics. We have to think through the unintended consequences of policies. Now what if Congress in 1973, instead of the takings provision, had thought of this ahead of time and said, actually, what can we do to incentivize landowners so that their interests will be aligned with the, the interests of endangered species? What if we had some sort of tax credit so that landowners that discovered endangered species would actually benefit rather than be harmed? We'd be discovering endangered species habitat that we didn't know existed. But this is something that's just set in concrete, and I despair that this particular provision will ever disappear. Now, when I talk about these things, I usually get this response. It's basically kind of a depressed look, uh, a, a feeling of despair. Okay, what do you want us to do? I, I talked about this sort of thing for an hour one time at a university. Uh, ran out of time, we had a few questions. On the way out, a woman came up to me and said, you know, I'm not gonna recycle anymore. <laughs> I didn't even talk about recycling. What are you talking about? That was what you got from my talk? See, what the, the sort of inference she had made is, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what the effects of the things that I do are, so why bother? That's not the point. The point is not why bother. The point is to stop and think and trace the unintended consequences of policies. In, other, in fact, there's actually a simpler way that we can describe this. I would say that the art of economics consists in asking what we can call the trillion dollar question. And you can guess why this is called the trillion dollar question. Here it is. And then what will happen? That is a really simple intellectual tool, a simple practice of prudence, prudence being to see the world as it is and to act accordingly. So that whenever anyone pro proposes an economic policy, we ignore the motive, assume good motives. In fact, exercise the principle of charity, assume if someone is proposing something, they mean it for good reasons. And then ignore that and focus on what's likely to happen anyway. That's practicing the art of economics. Now that's the sort of negative side of the story. What's the positive side of the story? Well, I'd say the positive side is both the practice the art of economics to ask and answer the trillion dollar question, and then to pr promote effective solutions rather than random acts of kindness. And to give you a description of what that looks like, I'd like to welcome Mr. Bob Woodson. Thank you very much. Maybe that's why you were sleeping back there. <laughs> and so, 
what, what we must do, though, is, is that the, the answers to poverty goes beyond what, what is being done on the left and the right. I believe that the, the fourth category of people who are poor because of the chances that they take and the choices that they make. Giving money to someone who's a drug addict or an alcoholic or who is otherwise irresponsible is injuring them with the helping hand. They need some sort of intervention in, so to help transform and redeem their character before transformation is needed as a precondition of helping them. But we refuse to kind of embrace this third. And so what we do at the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise we look for what are solutions to the poor. Um, and, and, and I believe that the reason that the word enterprise is in our name is because we believe that the principles that operate in our market economy, Jay, should operate in our social economy. In our market economy, only 3% of our people who are entrepreneurs, but they generate 70% of the jobs. Entrepreneurs tend to be C students, not A students. A students come back to universities and teach. C students come back and endow. <laughs> because when you're very smart, you have to have all the answers. And by the time the answers arrive, the opportunity is gone. And this is verified in a study by David Birch at MIT. He looked at 3,000 entrepreneurs to look at what is a characteristic of an entrepreneur. I know some venture capitalists that will not finance an entrepreneur that hasn't failed at least once, because overcoming failure evidence character. Do you realize that 60% of Apple's income came from a product that did not exist six years ago? No one did research to determine whether you want an iPhone. They provided a product, and, and, and Steve Jobs did not graduate from college. But in our market economy, we reward outcomes and not credentials. Certification is synonymous with qualification in our social economy, but not in our market economy. So what is lacking in helping the poor is that we look at low-income people and their communities as a social marketplace. And every other aspect of our life we are able to learn new and innovative techniques from untutored people. 70% of all pharmaceuticals have been created by aborigines somewhere around the world. Racer pine. In the 1950s, some untutored monks in Tibet were working with some people. They were dancing, going into frenzies as a part of their religious rituals. And these monks took these herbs and gave it to the people. When they came out of the temple, they were cooled out. So our pharmacist, uh, our, our uh, pharmacologist from Vine in New Jersey studied this and took these herbs and developed a compound, racer pine. And it is, a, it is the foundation the compound of our sedatives, which enable us to empty out our mental hospitals. But nobody said, but these monks don't have a degree. Because in our social, mark, in, our, in our market economy, we are more influenced by practical outcomes with, and, and rather than credentialed inputs. Okay, how does all this work? So what we do at the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise, uh, we go into low-income communities, unlike some of my, my scholarly friends who keep offering what I call failure studies, some of the, my scholarly friends are, uh, are public policy medical examiners. All they talk about, if you're born in a low-end community, you, you, you drop out of school, you have a baby, uh, and life is over for you. They never heard of the word redemption. And so what we do at the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise is we go into low-income communities, and we go not to the homes of the people where the children are dropping out of school or in jail and drugs, but we go to the, the school, to the homes where people are raising children successfully in spite of living in a toxic environment because they are the social entrepreneurs. They are doing something that is counterintuitive, that is enabling their children to survive. They are the source of new knowledge, 
of new wisdom if we could just go in and study what their success is, how they cope, and what lessons can we draw. And what we do at the Center for Enabled Enterprise, once we find people are able to thrive in that environment, we follow them around and ask. Let me give you a couple examples. May I have that water on the ground right there, please? Some quick examples, and then I have a brief video I'm going to show you. In my hometown of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, back in the 70s, it was the youth gang capital of America. There were 48 gang deaths every year. They used to publish the daily gang deaths next to the Vietnam deaths. A woman, Sister Falaka Patan, her husband, lived in a little uh, a house on Fraser Street. She had six sons. She found out that the oldest of her sons was a gang member. So she invited him to bring his friends home. He brought 15 of them home. They sat up all night talking about the challenges of young people. So she said, well, why don't you all move in with me? I don't know anything about gangs, but I know something about families. Now, that's crazy, right? But she moved all the furniture out, put mattresses, and she said, I've got six boys, a husband, now 15 others. In order for us to survive, we have to work, we have to be clean, we have to find ways of resolving our differences. When word circulated in the community that there was sanctuary from violence, there was a knock on her door. And all those boys, they retired her mortgage in two years and purchased five other houses in the community. And now she has 73 boys. And she says, there's peace in my community because I've got gang members from all over the city. What I want to do is take this leadership, send them throughout the whole city and have a gang summit, everybody thought she was nuts. So she sent, and, and, when, and when the officials found out that none of the black churches in the neighborhood would give her a place to meet, the Quakers at 4th and Arch Street gave their historic building for the meeting. The officials in Philadelphia canceled the Mummers Day Parade for the first time in the history of the city because they said it would be chaos. Long story short, these boys met, they signed a peace treaty, they said, Anyone wearing a picture with Sister Fatah on their t-shirt will have sanctuary. The gang deaths went down from 48 to 2 in one year and remained there forever. Uh, it's very interesting that, and so what I was blessed to do is follow her around for three years and just chronicle what she did. And I determined that there were nine principles Sociologists call them operating variables. <laughs> that explained how she was able to have such a dramatic impact on these boys. That all of the experts. Now, my uh, University of Penn School of Criminology had a multi-million dollar grant to do evaluation or uh, youth crime intervention, the School of Criminology. Not once in five years did anyone from that university set foot in that neighborhood to inquire of that woman and her husband or those kids why they and how they were able to bring about a dramatic change in the culture and behavior of those kids. And there are other examples like that in, um, in, in Washington, D.C., in a public housing development where 70% of the children are being raised in single-parent households the leadership of that group there in 10 years sent 800 kids to college or post-secondary education. CBS did a, a special on them PB, and other networks. Not a single scholar came knocking on the door to find out or to help her and for the rest of us to understand how she was able to do what she did. My point is that the source of innovation is, it resides within the experiences of people in those communities that have firsthand experience. The challenge that those of us who are professionals have is how do we take our skills and come in partnership with these grassroots entrepreneurs and then find out how we can be on tap but not necessarily on top. How can we add value to what they are doing but more important, to understand and to listen 
when you graduate from this university, unfortunate, there's go unfortunately, there's going to be an unfortunate byproduct, and that is you're going to have a good dose of intellectual imperialism. You're going to be, you, you, are, you are learning that wisdom only comes from people who, when they speak, their speech is clothed in prophecy. That if people speak and they dangle participles, split infinitives, and break verbs, they must be unwise. So therefore, I have no need to listen to them. And this is the challenge that we face as we try to construct a new policy to reduce poverty. And I, for two years, I took Congressman Paul Ryan all over this country once a month. And I said to him, I don't do drive-bys, give me a whole day. And his whole life has been touched and changed because he saw people that were broken. God never uses big shots in the Bible. Everybody in the Bible is broken. And, and I'd like to just take the time to show you at least a, a four-minute uh, clip of what Paul Ryan has seen. And the whole, we have a, um, a uh, seven, we have a, a series, a seven-minute, uh, ten-minute mini-series that you can uh, view the whole series. I'll let you just see for yourself. <laughs> When we were meeting uh, uh, in this conference room, and I had these gang members and all, and Paul said, at the end, he said, can we lay our hands and pray for Paul? I said, I don't think that works with Catholics. <laughs> but try it anyway. So he did. And, but Paul has been really moved by this experience. OK. Is it working? Four six two one eight seven eight two three seven seven five two one six. People are fleeing. There are more deaths in that zip code than in Iraq during the war. We're on the front line of the war. What are you doing out here tonight? Working, trying to get money to get my drugs. When was the last time you shot up? Yesterday in the morning. They got one foot in and one foot out, and they're about to go the wrong way. I made a decision in my life. That's where everything happened at that I would join the Mexican cartel. I committed a crime in 2007 and has followed me here to 2014. As the family goes. It just hurts so bad. So goes the community. So it becomes a warlike environment. That results in chaos, violence, confusion, and poverty. There's a life owls down to a grind, man. And it's a hell of a grind. That's why you gotta have people who remind those in this trap that is not permanent. And that you have the ability to get out. Nothing is more powerful or credible than a witness. Redemption is being able to look at yourself, do some self-introspection, and say, where I go wrong at? What is it that you are learning from your failure? I don't want to be that person anymore. I don't want to hurt people. I don't want to let people down. What led to that choice that made me go wrong? I thought a man was a hustler, a gangster, a man with kids by different women. That's what I thought a man was because I grew up without a father. And then you got to spend the rest of your life correcting. If I knew stuff I knew now back then, I don't want a whole different direction, man. There is a role people must play in their own uplift. If I have to come in here and tie shoestrings and water the plants, as long as I can get a paycheck, I'll yeah. do whatever it is I have to do. But I put a tank in the back of the van, a pressure washer, and went around and started washing cars in the community. Jasper's mobile car wash is taking off. And today I stand here, the largest minority food service company here in the city. We don't believe that folks can rise from the ashes. Life may have knocked you down. The judge said, you a menace to society when these sentence me. But these are Phoenix. You all are stories of hope. You can make a comeback from anything that's holding you down. 
And now the men are winning. They're getting victory in their lives because they feel like they're somebody. This thing right here changed my life. This life now with him, I can't even describe. I still believe that we have the capacity within our own nation to heal ourselves. But you have to have solutions that work. And the movement has to do with people. If you're going to fight a war, you better recruit some soldiers. The hood heroes are the heroes. They are social enterprises led by grassroots organizations that are very close to the people who have need, which if supported and empowered, can help people who otherwise would be stuck in poverty. Hope keeps you going when you don't have product. See, it's nothing like being hopeful that you can make it, man. That gives you the ability to go places that you never thought you could go. So the question is, what's a life worth to you? What's America worth? What do you think is the answer to poverty? Well, let me show you what I saw.